So, uh, yeah, I'm a historian. I teach history here at Holy Cross College in central Massachusetts. And uh, I think this is my second time giving a talk for Somerville. So always a good thing. And I, and I teach a course called Teddy Roosevelt's America. I was in the uh, big PBS six or eight hour document, uh, documentary, uh, not, not PBS, History Channel on Theodore Roosevelt um, just a year or so ago. So yeah, I do a lot of, in fact, I think if you look over my shoulder, you can see a Theodore Roosevelt bobblehead doll. So, um, and I've got a lot of, not that I'm a fanboy. I just, I have a lot, that's the period of time that I study 1870 to 1920 is really the kind of major uh, part of what I do. So inevitably Theodore Roosevelt uh, comes up. And as we'll see, there's a lot to like about Theodore Roosevelt, but we will also talk about some of the less um, less endearing uh, qualities to him or his, you know, his, his um, you know, as, as with every human being, his, his shortcomings. So uh, let's jump right in. Theod Theodore Roosevelt and his legacy. So Roosevelt uh, grows up, he's born into a, a wealthy, not super wealthy, but wealthy enough family um, and a family that has roots way back into the 17th century. So there are some of the earliest arriving families uh, to New Amsterdam, New York. And so when he is born in 1858, he's already a multi-generation American. He's born into a family that has uh, prospered. Um, his father, Theodore Roosevelt Sr., uh, is a very wealthy man, so so much so that he has, by the time Theodore is born, he is a um, very much a philanthropist and a, a volunteer. He's in involved in all kinds of um, public charities and working with the poor homeless children and all sorts of things in New York. And he takes Theodore Roosevelt uh, with him on these um, charitable ventures. And that's in some ways where that idea of public service and doing right by uh, the unfortunate uh, gets planted. Uh, his mother is Martha Bullock Roosevelt. She's from the South. And that makes for a very much an 1850s mixed marriage because um, obviously with Two years later, or three years later, after Roosevelt's born, the Civil War is ongoing, and it makes for a very tense um, household. But Roosevelt is brought up into a loving, wonderful family. He is a very sickly child, however. Um, even you know, their wealth can't keep him, can't save him from the fact that uh, he suffers from asthma. He's underweight. Um, he's constantly, you know, being hit with seizures of, um, you know, asthmatic seizures and so forth. And a ch even in a wealthy family, a child like that is generally expected not to live past age 10, 11, 12, just because of the weakened constitution and the fact that if you're, you know, you're suffering from these ailments, other things might uh, finish you off, you know, a bad bout of the flu and what have you. So the family was very apprehensive about, about young Roosevelt's um, chances of, of surviving. Uh, but he was doted upon by his uh, his sisters and treated very, you know, there was a very fortunate family where he had tutors, he had nursemaids and all the care that he could possibly want. And they took them to specialists to see if they could help him overcome uh, his, his asthma or mitigate the symptoms. Nothing really seemed uh, to work. One thing that, uh, so one of the ways that young sickly uh, kind of weak Roosevelt dealt with his condition uh, was he very much today would call him a nerd. He was loved reading. He devoured, you know, a book, a book or two a day, um, a, a habit that he kept up for all through his life. You know, he'd polish off a 250 page book in a single evening. Uh, but back when he was a child, one thing that he really got into was, you know, becoming in the idea of becoming a naturalist, somebody that would uh, study nature. And basically, he said many times, if I hadn't gotten into politics and done well in politics, I probably would have been a professor of natural, you know, I would have been a naturalist at a university or at a natural history museum. Um, and that's not an exaggeration. He was really good at it. He kept copious notes. He had samples whenever anybody in the family traveled somewhere. He said, can you bring me back of, you know, anything, you know, bring me back some bugs, bring me back some feathers, uh, what have you. And he put them in his little, he made sort of a little um, small natural history museum uh, in his home. And that love of nature, of course, is going to last all the way through his life. And that sort of why he loved the outdoors, why he loved the woods, why he loved hiking, uh, and ultimately why he became a great conservationist. So when you, Roosevelt was about 13 years old, his father says to him in pretty bluntly, look, you're in bad shape and we're going to do everything we can to save you. But you have to kind of commit to saving yourself and uh, remaking yourself through exercise, through diet, 
Um, and so Roosevelt famously says to himself, as he says in his autobiography, uh, I must make, I must remake my body. And so the family installs a small gym uh, in the home, hires trainers, and he takes to it uh, like, like nothing else. He starts putting on weight, he starts bulking up uh, and boxing all the time. And boxing is great exercise. And also the family thinks good for, for toughening him up to the point that by the time he's 18, he's actually quite well developed. He's much healthier. The asthmatic uh, seizures and 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 um, episodes of asthma um, seem to be uh, diminishing. And that's, you know, something that can happen with people. You never can sort of work out your way or exercise your way out of asthma. That just doesn't happen. But many people do find ways to um, mitigate their asthma and to live with it and also just to sort of, you know, develop a, a greater uh, or it, it diminishes the symptoms diminish as you as they get older. And that seems to be what happened with Theodore Roosevelt. But he will always tell this story. Um, see, when you're born rich and when you're born a Roosevelt, you can't have a rags to riches story. And in the era he grows up in, the self-made man is the big thing. So Andrew Carnegie can talk about coming from Scotland, penniness and working in a you know, a, a factory and then, you know, becoming a rich steel baron and other industrialists can tell similar stories. Roosevelt can't tell that story. So his self-made story, this is his self-made story. It's his, it's any, he will tell it over and over again. So everybody knows if they know anything about Roosevelt is that he almost died, but he, you know, got it together and built his strength and built his body and took on what he eventually calls, you know, the strenuous life it becomes kind of his, his uh, persona. Yeah. And there you go. The political cartoons will invariably show Theodore Roosevelt uh, with two sort of themes. One is the box in the boxing rings, which is, of course, uh, where the, um, you know, that's a good political metaphor. And then also as a cowboy. And we'll get to that uh, in just a moment. So Roosevelt uh, uh, is privately tutored all his life until he heads off to Harvard College. Columbia University is just up uptown, but too close. So he goes off to Harvard. Um, and he does not have a good go of it early on. Um, he is very sheltered. He's never really been around other boys. He's never really, you know, seen anybody chew tobacco or drink alcohol or tell dirty jokes. And he is a very much what we'd call a prude. He and in it really, you know, does not impress his rowdy colleagues uh, as a guy who's much fun to be around. And so he's kind of shunned. Uh, and it's a real hard experience for him because he's his first time living away from home. But he he throws himself into his studies. He stands out as a great student, uh, makes impressions on on professors. And he eventually, over time, starts to lighten up, you know, and we do see in his diary that uh, he does go out to to uh, bars and does have some fun, a typical um, uh, college fun. So he and he becomes by the time he graduates, you can see the photo down below there. He's a member of the staff of the college uh, newspaper. So he finds other ways to make friends and other ways to become socially uh, active. He also falls in love. So he falls in love while in Boston, in Cambridge, near Boston, uh, with a uh, the daughter of a prominent Boston family, the Lee family. Alice Hathaway Lee is, uh, by everybody's account, a stunning beauty. And Roosevelt is totally smitten with her when they meet uh, in 1878. Uh, and so he's 20 years old. She's, I think, a little bit younger. And he wrote, he he said many times over, you can read the quotation down there, as long as I live, I shall never forget how sweetly she looked and how prettily she greeted me. Um, and so they, he falls madly in love with her. She fends him off a little for eight, 10 months, but finally agrees to marry him. And they're married um, in 1880 at the age of 22. So things are going well for young Roosevelt. He's got his college degree. He's got a, a beautiful, loving uh, wife. And uh, Things are, and he's looking to get into politics. And so he does that shortly uh, thereafter. Two years later, he's elected to the New York State Assembly um, and gets reelected in uh, successive years. And right away, he stands out um, as a reformer and a person that uh, is one to one to watch. Now, he's a Republican. Republicans um, in that era are much more pro-business, and they're also just a lot lot less interested in reform um, and interested in, you know, uh, development and, and the big business and that sort of thing. And Roosevelt is uh, very much wants to go after corruption, go after nepotism, go after, you know, uh, bu budgetary sh shenanigans. And you can see in this image here, he looks very young. It's uh, And Puck Magazine, of course, is a super prominent political magazine in those days. Um, and that's Tammany Hall that's in the cage. So that's they're the Democrats and that they're symbolized by the tiger. That's the political symbol of, of Tammany Hall. And he has trapped the tiger, uh, the 
you know, the, the, the voracious, you know, this is the Tammany Hall's, the political organization of Boss Tweed, of infamous corruption, et cetera. And he has somehow managed to cage the tiger. And here he is clipping off the fangs or clipping off the, you know, the, um, the claws of, of the tiger. So good metaphors there showing how much he's um, making a name for himself as a reformer. The Republican Party doesn't like him because he's too much of a reformer and he's, you know, kind of spoiling the party that everybody's uh, having. But he is a great speaker. He's very charismatic. And so, they're sort of a divided opinion of him. Two years later, 1884, um, on no nothing le no less than Valentine's Day, 1884, double tragedy strikes. Roosevelt's up in Albany. His wife is has delivered their first child, a baby baby Alice, and is convalescing at the at the family home. When suddenly she's stricken with ultimately you know, kidney failure, it's called Bright's disease, um, and he's informed. He gets back, but by the time he gets back to the house. Uh, she is dead at the age of 22. And you can see in his personal diary, he just writes a black X and writes, the light has gone out of my life. That same evening, the same day, just hours later, his mother in the same house also died. So, uh, and and died fairly unexpectedly. So um, it's a dark, you know, uh, tragic day in his life. And he's really, as, that, as his diary entry indicates, a real body blow. Um, he can't go back to work in the state legislature uh, right away. He feels like he has to, you know, what he does what he does here is he does something that he do, will do for the rest of his life. When things get tough, he kind of heads out into the wilderness to kind of find himself again. And so in this case, um, he heads out to the Dakotas and uh, invests in a cattle operation. And this is where he uh, indulges in his love of the outdoors and horseback riding and all, uh, but also the fantasy of being a cowboy. I mean, he's a the, a cowboy from Manhattan who went to Harvard. Uh, he strikes the real cowboys as kind of hilarious at first and a bit of a joke. He's got, you know, big goggly uh, eyeglasses. Um, he has, he speaks in very clipped, you know, aristocratic uh, terms. Like I say there, good fellow, fetch that cow. You know, uh, they think it's, they think he's just uh, hilarious. But uh, over time they realize he's the real deal. I mean, he's, he's tough as nails. He, is every bit as good as, as they are in the saddle. He will sit 12 hours, 16 hours in the saddle, work just as hard as they are, eat the same lousy food, sleep in the you know freezing rain and so forth. So they gradually grow to really admire him, um, kind of doubly so because he comes from this privileged uh, life. He spends about two years out in the West and ultimately that cattle operation will collapse. It's part of a much larger collapse of the cattle industry. It's not really through any fault of uh, Theodore Roosevelt, but he comes back in 1880. There he is, uh, again, kind of solidifying that image, the actual image of the guy who fancies himself a cowboy, but also metaphorically, it's a wonderful political association. Um, think about how many decades we heard of John McCain, Senator John McCain as the maverick, right? You know, the the and that that kind of similar image was, was the case with Roosevelt. Yeah. Okay. So, um, he comes back in 1886, gets back and uh, starts getting back involved in, in politics. And to his astonishment and to his chagrin, uh, he falls in love with a childhood friend, Edith Caro. She, he, they were good friends growing up. They actually had a little bit of a, we'd say a small R romance uh, when they were uh, teenagers, but they sort of fizzled. Um, not clear why, uh, doesn't really matter. And then he went off to college, went off to uh, married uh, Alice and so forth. Uh, but now four years later, when Alice died, Roosevelt did a very Rooseveltian, high Victorian thing, which was to announce to himself and everyone else he would never remarry, right? Just not going to happen. I don't care how young I am, et cetera. Uh, I'm going to, you know, as his phrase was, I'm going to remain constant. And when he found himself falling in love with Edith, he was heard, overheard, like in the family, you know, drawing room, walking back and forth, pacing, hate hard, saying, I must be constant. I must be constant. I must be constant, meaning I must stand up to my feelings and suppress my feelings and not fall for Edith and certainly not marry her. But lo it, it didn't work. Um, Edith was a very different woman, highly intelligent, um, highly educated, very, very thoughtful. And many people believe that this marriage is actually what makes Theodore Roosevelt go as far as he does. Um, his first wife was not a hindrance, but she was um, kind of a hothouse flower. She was not, not particularly uh, learned, certainly not interested in politics. And Edith is, becomes really Theodore Roosevelt's great um, cons you know, consulting partner uh, and giving him advice. And he turns to her all the time 
uh, throughout his life. So she becomes a great asset to him. Uh, and they have a wonderful marriage and they, and they have, you know, uh, four children of their own. And that's going to be an important part of Roosevelt's persona as well. The cowboy, uh, the, the boxer, but also the, the family guy. All right. So Roosevelt begins his ascent soon thereafter. He's picked by President Harrison to serve a get his first federal job in Washington D.C. The at, with the U.S. Civil Service Commission. Civil service is a new thing. It's they're trying to clean up corruption in politics. Roosevelt's the perfect guy for it. And you can see this wonderful image of him. He's holding a sword that says "Civil Service Rules," and he's about to whack this nefarious-looking character, uh, which on his club it says "Spoils System," which is means the the corrupt, you know, that's the nickname for the corruption um, of Washington, D.C. Uh, you can get a little bit closer look here. So this kind of David and Goliath image of Roosevelt not caring about the consequences and going much further than, than President Harrison would have wanted him to. Nonetheless, he uh, stays on the job for uh, a little more than five years. And that's when he begins to develop that uh, that reputation. Oh, I think I jumped ahead here. Yeah, so in 1895, um, a new opportunity around uh, emerges and it's a it's in some ways it's going to require he leave Washington, so it's kind of a dilemma whether he should do it or not. But he's offered to become the president of the New York City Board of Police Commissioners because in the year before 1894 1895 New York City was embroiled in you know one of its periodic spectacular police corruption uh, scandals. Not just corruption, but you know, tremendous you know, thousands of pages of testimony from New Yorkers about corruption, about violence, about um, shakedowns, about you know everything, everything you could possibly fear in a police department was happening in New York, and so they bring in a, a reform mayor gets elected and decides they're going to bring in Roosevelt to head up the kind of commission that's going to shake up and clean up um, New York City's police department so that it uh, no longer is in the papers for, for all the wrong reasons. And you can see, if you want to learn more about that, then my friend Dan Citrom wrote a great book about it. Um, it's kind of a, you know, one of the great scandals of the, of the 1890s. So there's Roosevelt at his desk at 300 Mulberry Street, uh, police headquarters in New York City. And he is going to make a, again, make a name for himself. Um, he's not going to give speeches or he'll give, he'll give speeches, but he will also do things to garner attention and to, to promote change. So he begins, he contacts his friend, uh, Jacob Reese, who by that time is quite famous for prowling the slums of New York and taking photos of the poor and photos of the homeless. His book, How the Other Half Lives, was published just a few years earlier and became a great bestseller. And uh, so Roosevelt turns to Reese, his new friend, and says, take me on one of those midnight tours. Show me how you go through the you know, the, the underside of New York. And they do. And he finds, you can see in this image here, a drunk, sl sleeping policeman who is on duty. And this is just one of many of the kind of encounters they have with people shirking their duty, uh, dereliction of duty, taking bribes, et cetera. And so Roosevelt, you know, uh, cleans house, fires all kinds of police. He ends up creating the first New York City Police Academy, uh, creates training you know, rules and all kinds of other things that, you know, standardize uh, weapons and uniforms and so forth. So he's a really part of a real shakeup uh, of the department. And this gar garners national headlines because the scandal had garnered national headlines as well. Yeah, you can see the the image of the, you know, the squeaky clean crusader uh, and Mayor Strong looking at him um, and pointing at, you know, the, um, the the policemen in the in the distance there that are beating up somebody. So Roosevelt is this very much that crusader image. And in, in fact, the crusader reality, which is he does kind of sh come to town, does, you know, lets heads roll, takes a huge hit. One thing he does is he enforces the Sunday closing laws which means you can't go to a bar or a saloon on Sundays because it's against the law. Nobody had paid attention to the law for decades. Roosevelt comes to town and says, I'm not against drinking. I think the working man should have his opportunity to have a, his, his, uh, his beer and his whiskey on Sundays, but it's against the law and I have to enforce the law. So he took a lot of heat for that, but it was also one of those righteous stands that Roosevelt was very famous for, uh, for taking and kind of showing that he wasn't afraid to take the heat for what he thought was the, the right thing. So this attention gets another prominent Republican's attention. President McKinley appoints Roosevelt Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1897, a very prominent position. And one of the reasons why it's so prominent is that the U.S. in the 1880s and 1890s had been greatly expanding its military fleet, its naval fleet. And that's because by the 1890s, the United States is on the doorstep of becoming the world's biggest industrial power. And it, they, there's a consensus among many people that we need to have the 
world's biggest military power to go with that, to protect our interests and to project our power and, and so forth. And the Navy is viewed as crucial to that. So in 1880, the U.S. Navy was 12th in the world. The U.S. Um, uh, engages in a lot of shipbuilding. And by 1900, um, the Navy is third in the world and spreading its influence and spreading its footprint um, uh, around the globe. So Roosevelt's part of that and very eager to be part of that. Then, next chapter, things happen, begin to happen uh, not far away in a place called Cuba, just 80 to 90 miles off the tip of Florida. Uh, and Americans by the 1890s are paying very close attention to what's happening there. Throughout much of the Caribbean and Latin America, there are independence movements, uh, Very all the nations that we know in, in that region, Mexico, Bolivia, uh, Guatemala, et cetera, they're all gaining their independence in the 19th century. And Cuba is the last really important Spanish holding in the, the new world, in, in the, the Western world. And they do not want to give it up. And so the Cuban people begin to rise up and say they de demanding their independence and Spanish authorities, as you can see in this uh, drawing from a newspaper uh, article, uh, begin to repress this and begin to crush any, uh, any you know, insurrection, any attempt to overthrow Spanish rule. And Americans take tremendous interest in this because we have this thing now called the yellow press, the sensational tabloid press. Um, the New York Journal, uh, published by Hearst, uh, begins to cover this breathlessly and basically saying over and over again, the reason they want to cover it is they're saying the US must do something about this. We can't let this atrocity take place just on our, you know, it's on our doorstep. We can't be sit idly by. In the same way that you can't watch somebody get mugged across the street and not run across the street to help them, <clears throat> a nation like us who has high ideals about freedom and democracy has to intervene. And you can see from this, you know, the, the sensational coverage here, blood on the roadsides, blood on the fields, blood on the doorsteps, blood, blood, blood. This is why I think they should call it the red press, not the yellow press. Um, the old, the young, the weak, the crippled, all butchered without mercy by the Spanish. Um, and then the New York World, which was um, Pulitzer's paper in competition. Is there, you know, is there no nation wise enough, brave enough to aid this blood smitten land? Of course, he's thinking the United States uh, should do that. So uh, I'll make a long, long story short. Most politicians in America uh, are resisting this, including President McKinley. We do send a naval vessel down to Havana Harbor, the, the USS Maine, to kind of emphasize our presence and the fact that we're watching. And it mysteriously blows up in the uh, winter in February of 1898, killing 260 US sailors. That put, that does not cause us to declare war, but it puts us on a, you know, very the fast track to eventually declaring war. Uh, because everybody doesn't think it's an accident. Everybody is convinced, largely because of these newspapers, that the Spanish blew it up on purpose. Um, historians know through lots of research and so forth, that it's almost certainly was an accident, just simply a boiler explosion. But um, that's how a lot of history is written, a lot of chapters of history, a lot of historical turns occur on sheer accidents uh, such as this. So we enter in April of 1898, uh, we, we declare war um, and go after, decide that we're going to liberate Cuba from Spanish treachery. And that's called the Splendid Little War. Uh, we always think our wars are going to be splendid and little and short and bloodless, uh, and they never turn out that way, except here. Um, it's not bloodless, but relative to other wars, it is very short. It only lasts a couple of months. Um, only a few thousand uh, people uh, are killed, uh, and we the, the spoils of this war are immense for the United States. So let's take a and this is what the, gives Roosevelt the opportunity to truly go viral, uh, to use modern terminology. Uh, as soon as the war breaks out, he is very, what we'd call jingoistic, very militaristic. He has read every Walter Scott uh, novel and every, uh, you know, book that he's ever, you know, over his lifetime, many times over tales of daring do and tales of heroism and military glory and martyrdom. And he wants a piece of this, right? He believes that it's essential for a man, a real man, to be a, mil be a military figure. Uh, this is one reason why he was, he loved his father. He adored his father. He said his father was the only person he was ever intimidated by, but he could never understand why his father opted not to fight in the civil war. It just like, he couldn't square those two things. Uh, so he's, but he's not going to miss his opportunity. Even though his wife is quite sick, he says, I got to go. And he forms the, the United States first cavalry, a uh, first volunteer cavalry, uh, one of three such regiments of voluntary cavalry, um, about a thousand soldiers, 
coming from all walks of life. Some of them are Harvard friends, but some of them are cowboy friends and and, and people in between. And they are a mounted unit. They they pra they they practice. They gain the, get. And Roosevelt designs a uniform for them. Notice, look at his uniform. It's sort of a melda a mashup between uh, the the Buffalo Bill uh, costume and a traditional cowboy's costume. And he's very much ready for uh, his moment in the spotlight. They uh, have a very difficult time getting to Cuba. It's not a very well-run operation. They are a mounted unit with over 1,500 horses, and they go to Cuba with no horses. It's lucky that for them, they were lucky to have gone to Cuba at all. There weren't enough ships, and they kind of sneak their way onto a ship, get to Cuba, and decide to become a mount, you know, a, a, a foot soldiers, um, even though they are they are cavalry. And Roosevelt will seize the moment to find you know, the action. He also uh, cultivates reporters. And so he's a very good politician at this point. And he knows that he, he can't risk not getting into the spotlight and not getting headlines. So he brings along reporters and uh, photographers and uh, artists for newspapers and magazines. And their moment comes just a few weeks after they land in Cuba, where in the taking of uh, the main city in Cuba, they, they the Rough Riders rush up San Juan Hill. They actually kind of go up Kettle Hill, which is sort of adjacent to San Juan Hill, doesn't really matter. It's known as the charge up San Juan Hill. And for all of Roosevelt's theatrics and, you know, romanticism and, and you know, trying to fit himself into one of the novels that he so loved, he is a very physically courageous person. There's no question that he knew that this might be his, his, his finest hour might actually include his glorious death. Uh, he took, you know, bullets passed through his clothing, Horses were shot or people were shot next to him, but they charged up the hill, drove the Spanish off uh, and Clay and won the day. And that makes headlines all across the country. You can see this Puck magazine, um, you know, uh, cover here where Roosevelt literally looks like an action figure. Um, and that's because that's the way he's he's being treated. Uh, here's another, you know, the typical uh, coverage, big Sunday spread uh, in a magazine, cowboy troopers under Roosevelt. Um, and you know the exuberant coverage of the uh, the, the daring do the the cowboys of the West being who are taught to fight Indians now are being brought to Cuba to to whip Spaniards. So Roosevelt just gets immense, and then he writes an account of it, um, his his own memoir as quickly as possible. And that's another thing about Roosevelt. He was not only a great scholar and a great reader, but he also loved to write, and he needed to write because he he wasn't that wealthy. He was fairly wealthy, but he had a pretty you know, a multi had multiple homes and so forth. And he realized that like Winston Churchill did, another guy with a, a lot of heritage, but not a lot of cash, that one way to prop things up would be to write best-selling books. And so Roosevelt will do uh, just that. I think, I don't know anything, if it's for certain, but certainly Churchill did the same thing a, a generation uh, later. Um, and so the, the spoils for the United States um, are that we become a global power, we become an empire, we become an imperial power. So now we are at the table with all the other imperial powers like Great Britain, like Germany, France, um, Portugal, uh, et cetera. Now, in, the, in modern times, we shy away from the idea of being an empire and think of imperialism as a, a negative word. That is not the case in 1898. Um, many Americans opposed it, but most Americans, as you can see from this cartoon that ran in the Phil in a Philadelphia newspaper, most Americans are pretty psyched that we are, you know, as it says here, 10,000, you know, an American empire, 10,000 miles from tip to tip. Uh, we've got holdings in the Caribbean, we've got holdings in the Pacific, and we're not going to give them up. We are going to, like Great Britain, like other powers, ha be able to have holdings around the world that we will allow us to enrich ourselves, but also to project our military power. Again, this, this incident gains not just headlines, but opportunities. And so the Republican Party, as soon as Roosevelt comes back in the summer of 1898, because it was short war, they tab him to be to run for governor in the state of New York. Of course, he wins. You can see the he's, his uh, campaign pin features him as the Rough Rider. And uh, he wins handily and spends two years as governor of New York. And not surprisingly, he is Roosevelt. So he's he's not going to change his ways. He's really into uh, using the office for good, for promoting uh, reforms like tenement reform, labor reforms, um, trying to do things to, to in, in spread uh, public education and so forth. So he's a, a that's a through line that we'll see throughout his throughout his career. While he's governor of New York, if you're if you're governor of New York in those days, um, it, today it's to some degree still true. But when you're governor of New York in the late in the 19th century, you are automatically a presidential uh, contender, and that's and so for Roosevelt in this case, he's going to be seen as a 
uh, presidential booster, right? That McKinley is running for re-election. He needs a, a new vice president and he needs, a, he's hoping, you know, kind of use that Rooseveltian mojo to win re-election and get, and get a second term. Roosevelt, of course, has a big decision to make here because he knows that the office of vice president is usually the graveyard of political ambition. Many, many, you know, rising stars took that number two spot and only one or two have ever gone beyond, you know, to, to any other office. Um, Roosevelt is also a man of action. He did not, not used to sitting in a ceremonial office. Nonetheless, he takes the office, McKinley is elected, and Roosevelt spends six miserable months as a do-nothing vice president. You know, there's nothing for him to do, and it drives him kind of uh, crazy, given his, his sort of exuberant, hyper um, personality. But uh, McKinley, uh, oh, there, there's another uh, poster there, you can see McKinley trying to get it, draw as much of Roosevelt's uh, um, appeal as possible. But McKinley is shot that same year. So they, they win election, they're inaugurated in March of 01, and McKinley is shot uh, in September. And uh, he lingers for a while, um, but Roosevelt is, uh, and Roosevelt is up, you know, hiking in the mountains um, in, in upstate New York when he's notified that the president has taken a turn for the worst. And he uh, rushes, you know, they, they run, send a car up there, they r rush him to, um, to where the president is, but the, the president uh, dies soon thereafter. And so Roosevelt is rapidly sworn into office. He's only 42 years old. He's the youngest person uh, to hold the office. And it's a real kind of turning point uh, in his life. The thing that he always wanted, but he sort of figured would come to him down the road has suddenly been uh, thrust upon him. Uh, young president and uh, coming, you know, on the heels of that of great tragedy. Um, McKinley was also shot by an anarchist, so or someone who's at least is was presented to the public as a as an anarchist, most likely someone also mentally imbalanced. But uh, so there's a certain fear in the country of anarchism and and uh, assassination and so forth. So Roosevelt's coming in at a pretty uh, tense, sad time. Uh, one of the famous quips uh, comes, so the Republican establishment, as I mentioned earlier, doesn't like Roosevelt because he's super popular, but he's also, he's his own guy. And he also pushes for, for reforms that they're not interested in. And so he's a real thorn in their side. So Mark Hanna is, you know, one of the great masterminds of Republican politics in the late 19th century. He's a kingmaker, a president maker. And when they propose that Roosevelt be picked as the vice president to McKinley, he says, no way, don't do it. Bad idea. This guy's a loose cannon. He's going to be, you know, you, you think it may be sending him to his political graveyard, not him. And so when McKinley died and Roosevelt was sworn in, Hannah famously said, now look, that damn cowboy is president of the United States. You know, I told you, basically, I told you so. The Roosevelts are unique um, in that they are a, a young family and they have uh, five children. And they all arrive at the White House with all that childlike exuberance, and and they and Roosevelt does is not interested in the least in um, running a tight ship. He thinks kids should be kids and have fun, and he loves to you know roll on the ground with them, uh, just you know like any other uh, any other dad, even though he is president of the United States. And so the the White House, which by the way Re Roosevelt is the guy that starts calling it what was formerly called the Executive Mansion. He's the one who popularizes. Uh, the the name the White House. Um, he's also the guy that popularizes kind of a sim sense of his ego, uh, playing hail to the chief when the president uh, arrives anywhere. But uh, so th this uh, the White House was quite the place of bedlam. Uh, there were these young kids running around. They brought a menagerie of of animals, chickens, dogs, a pony, and you can see the it, you may not be able to tell, but the three of them there in the upper left are playing with guinea pigs. So the house is literally climbing. There's this, there are stories of, you know, the ambassador of such and such company, country coming into a, a meeting with Roosevelt and pulling out his chair to sit down and there being a snake in the chair. You know, um, great, the press loved this stuff because it was it was hilarious. The kids also were up to all kinds of mischief. You know, they just, when they wanted to play baseball, they just took out a shovel and dug out a, a diamond on the White House lawn. Um, they threw snowballs at the Secret Service. It was just, you know, kind of fun, fun times at, at uh, uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And the president uh, really loved it. Now, one of the things that this talk is focusing on is the legacy of Theodore Roosevelt. And there's a lot to talk about there. We already talked about the way he, in many ways, transforms the presidency into 
uh, the kind of presidency that we see today and also cultivates the press um, and kind of cultivates a sort of larger role for the president as, as a more dominant office in the, in the 20th uh, century. He also promotes uh, progressivism at the, uh, and we'll get into the details of that in just a moment. Um, you know, and largely what he's going to focus on is people in the 19th century have been asking, you know, the, the big, the Gilded Age, the period leading up to Roosevelt's presidency, is rocked by strikes, by a, a growing levels of poverty, uh, tremendous social unrest. I mean, lots of good stuff happening, lots of technology and wealth creation, lots and lots of strikes and social unrest and fears that the country is coming apart at the seams um, and great fear about big business. You know, they they are they, the founders could never have envisioned people like John D. Rockefeller. You know, they they were worried about the government being a, a threat to liberty. And now you have a, an unelected person who's the richest person on the face of the earth who can buy the entire U.S. U.S. Senate, who can you know do do anything he wants because he's so wealthy. So what to do about this po power? This is what progressivism is all about. It's a it's a transnational movement. It's happening in Europe as well as the United States. And in in the U.S., it's basically rethinking our, our understanding of government. So <clears throat> this will get a little wonky, but just trust me, it's very simple. The traditional Republican, small r, uh, notion of the state. So like what people like Madison, Jefferson, Hamilton were thinking was that power, so when they created the government, the constitution, they said power is the great threat to liberty. Everybody believed that was true. And that the state, which is the source of all power, must be kept weak in order not to trample people's liberties. That was widely uh, agreed upon as well. Well, a hundred years later, we now live in a modern society, a modern industrial capitalist society. Everything is different from the rural days, agricultural days of the 1790s. And so progressivism argues that in order to per persist, to endure as a republic uh, that is that believes in democracy, we have to do, we have to rethink this formula, right? So we still agree, like Jefferson, that power is the great threat to liberty, but the greatest power in America is no longer the state. The greatest power in America now is in private hands. It's in big business. Rockefeller, Carnegie, uh, J.P. Morgan, and those guys. And so the state, which we used to fear, now we need to give some power to that state in order to place it as kind of a referee to uh, protect American liberty. The state will stand between the powerful interests of big business and the necessary interests of the people. So it's, it's a uh, reformulation of things, but it's as as even Jefferson said, uh, you know, looking ahead to the future, you're going to have to figure out what the form of this republic down the road. We don't, you know, what we wrote in uh, the Constitution and what we've done in the first 20 years is not, you know, cutting anything in stone. Despite what you hear about something uh, called originalism, which is, you know, we can talk about that some other time. All right. So there are two main principles of of the of progressivism. One is an emphasis on the common good. We always, we've long believed in individualism and in the Gilded Age, individualism was all the rage. This is, you know, as though it's the only thing that matters. The founding fathers were believed in the common good. They also believed in individual liberties, absolutely, but they also believed in the common good. And so this is a, a movement that is saying, look, we've lost our way. Uh, the, the pendulum is swung way over to the side of individualism, uh, leaving behind the, the common good, the things that we, institutions, laws, practices that help the great majority of people. So, and one way, one aspect of ensuring the common good is greater government power, greater powers of regulation to beat back corporate individualism, which is what we call laissez-faire, basically hands off, no regulations whatsoever. We have to do these things in order to preserve our democracy. So, uh, and here you can see, you know, the, the lead up to Roosevelt's presidency. This is from 1889 showing the bosses of the Senate, you know, a very vivid cartoon showing the little itty bitty senators in the, in the foreground and the giant corporate interests literally shaped by money bags coming through the door. And notice the doorway says entrance for monopolists. And above the, in the middle of the frame, it says, this is the Senate of the monopolies, by the monopolies, for the monopolies. And way in the back, you can see towards the left, it says people's entrance, and there's a sign on it that says closed. You don't have to be a political scientist to figure out what they're saying here, right? Money has, corporate money is flooding into Washington and taking over our democracy, shutting out the voices of the people, the desires of the people, the needs of the people. Now, yeah, here's just another example of, this is not, you know, uh, imagined, this is real. Cor monopolies and huge trusts are on the rise. Um, oh yeah, well, I, I 
for some reason that that first graphic there, uh, 1870, you have 800 in eight iron and steel companies. And by 1900, I don't think you can see it. It says only 70. So you go from 808 to 70, consolidation. And railroads, the same thing. By 1900, instead of dozens and dozens of railroads, there's only seven large railroads in the United States. Similar concentration of power and concentration of business that we've seen in America in the last 25 years. And here's a great image. This is again showing tiny little crusading uh, Theodore Roosevelt on Wall Street in Manhattan uh, with his with his crusader's sword. But look at, you know, Jack and the and the Wall Street giants. Theodore Roosevelt thinking about taking, and that's J.P. Morgan there in the, you know, on the right-hand side and other recognizable big business titans. It looks like no match, but that's the point. Roosevelt is going to take these folks on and largely win. Roosevelt, here's a great way of framing this, you know, his justification for taking on big business in this way. He's not anti-capitalist, he's a raging capitalist, but he says, bigness and abuse of power is the problem. Um, and this is a great way of framing it. He says, the corporations or trusts are the creatures of the state, meaning there's no such thing as a trust. There's no such thing as a corporation. We invented it, on, we created this idea and then we put it on paper, but you know, it's not a, a part of a natural universe. Um, there, there is, you can't go into the woods and find a trust. Uh, you can't, you know, get up in a drone and observe trusts, right? They, they, they don't exist. So they're the creatures of the state. We, as people, our government, we created something called the corporation and the state, which created them, not only has the right to control them, but is duty bound to control them whenever such need, whenever need of such control is shown. So we've created corporations and we have the right and the need to regulate them. And there's classic image of Roosevelt uh, as the trust buster, 44 antitrust suits, uh, pursued while he was president. I think there were five in the previous ten years, and none of them fit, none of them uh, succeeded. So uh, he breaks up, you know, huge railroad trusts, takes on J.P. Morgan. We, we don't need to get into all the details, but it's a pretty impressive record. Now he he did, you know, didn't quite ever define like what people said. Well, which trust are you going to go after? And he literally said, "I'm going to go after the bad ones." Uh, and he. They said, well, how do you know what's the difference between a good one and a bad one? He says, I can just tell. <laughs> so it doesn't exactly leave kind of a, a good measuring stick for how to do this, but um, he does take on some of the biggest corporations in the world and forces them to break up, forces them uh, to you know cancel deals and that sort of thing. So a second way in which we see his legacy is that he's, so one is corporate regulation. The other is labor rights. So in 1902, one year into his presidency, coal miners go on strike. This is a big deal in 1902 because the entire country runs on coal. This would be like a, a telecom strike uh, today. If all the phone companies and telecom uh, companies had a, had a work stoppage, the whole country would grind to a halt. Same with coal. So Roosevelt has to take this very, very seriously. Now, in the past, when presidents had big coal strikes or railroad strikes, what did they do? Uh, they called in the military and the military opened fire and killed dozens, scores, hundreds of people. Uh, on several occasions. And it's pretty bloody stuff. It also doesn't look like, it doesn't look to people in this era as very American. It looks like Russia. They often compare these incidents to what the czar would do to his people. And so Roosevelt says, I'm not going to do that. And people came to Roosevelt and said, send in the military, get the army to seize control of the mines, force the workers back to work. Roosevelt says, I'm not going to do that. That's going to lead to bloodshed. Everybody knows that. And uh, the, by the way, the coal mine operators, the you know the big business guys running the coal mines, they, they have some guilt here too. The long and the short of it is Roosevelt, instead of sending in the military, calls the miners, the mine operators and the mine union leaders and force, you know, says you, basically you can't, you've got to settle this. And he sets up a board of arbitration and they they work it out and they each side gives a little and the strike is called off. The workers get a raise. They get a shortened, out, shortened work week. Uh, the mine operators get a certain number of concessions. And so Roosevelt uses the power of his office to act neutral, right? To be the arbiter between the people and big business. And it's a real precedent setting move by a US president, whereas the others had either done nothing or sent in the military. A third legacy of Roosevelt, and there's a lot of them, but we're just going to look at these three, um, is conservationism, you know, what we call environmentalism. Roosevelt loved the outdoors. He was, as we say, a budding naturalist when he was young. He loved reading about uh, the environment and he loved hiking and, you know, seeing uh, America's beauty. He really believed it was the, you know, he would, in the White House, when, you know, on a, any given day, he, a cabinet member would come to meet him and he'd say, let's go for a walk or let's go for a hike. And, you know, and they'd, next thing you know, they're storming through the hills outside of Washington, D.C., you know, working up a sweat because Roosevelt just felt reinvigorated by the outdoors. 
Uh, so when he becomes president, um, he sets his sights on doing what other presidents refuse to do, which is to take on the big corporate interests that were trying to carve up and develop and mine all the natural beauty uh, in the American West. And so he, prefer, he this is a picture of him with the famous a nature, I guess what we call naturalist, uh, John Muir, uh, who was the great defender of Yosemite and the great what become the great national parks and the great beauty of the West and a real kind of philosophical uh, poet of the beauties of nature. And it, you know they they meet up, they they camp and hike for three days. It's a great it's a great meeting of the of the president and this this kind of visionary uh, guy John Muir. And Roosevelt, in uh, seven years in office, will do more than any other president before or since. Create five national parks, eight national monuments, 51 bird reserves, four game preserves, 150 national forests, more than 230 million acres of land taken out of commercial development uh, in order to preserve it for future generations. So, and, and of course, other presidents will use that precedent to add to that over and over and over and over again. That's why we have such a wonderful natural parks the national park system and many, many other, uh, the, the precedent for establishing a wildlife preserve here and a national monument uh, there. So Roosevelt, those are probably his three most important legacies. Other legacies are more mixed. So on the one hand, Ro President Roosevelt uh, did pretty daring things when it came to race. This is the era of Jim Crow and a seethingly racist Southern delegation in Congress uh, that is committed to Jim Crow. And yet he invites the Martin Luther King of his day, Booker T. Washington, to have uh, lunch at the, at the White House to sort of talk out like what's what's going on and what what is what is the state of race relations and so forth. Um, to Roosevelt again, it's one of these practical things. Like I should I should talk to this guy, find out what what's happening. Um, and but the Southern uh, politicians go ballistic, and Roosevelt quickly quickly you know backpedals says basically it was a handshake, it wasn't a lunch, and kind of really steps back from that um, what was well-intended effort. Roosevelt also hires large, like throughout the civil service, throughout the government, throughout the post office, throughout lots of fills and allows to be filled many, many government offices well, with career African-Americans who um, are using, you know, seizing the opportunity to get good jobs uh, in the government. Woodrow Wilson, who will succeed um, uh, two steps later in the White House will see to that most of those folks are fired. He will purge black workers from uh, the federal service. But Roosevelt's the guy that put most of them in that position. Um, Roosevelt, the, the Brownsville incident was also one where Roosevelt's, you know, views on race were uh, not particularly enlightened. Um, a black regiment in Brownsville, Texas was accused of uh, shooting up a town, the town of Brownsville. And it's a very complicated story, but the long and the short of it is Roosevelt was told about this and he said, they're all dismissed um, you know, from the service. They are all uh, summarily discharged from uh, the, uh, I, guess he, I guess what they said is he he demanded that they confess or that they tell what happened. And they were like, no, we don't know what happened. We don't, we weren't, we, we weren't there. There's proof that we were in our barracks. And Roosevelt said, all right, all of you are dishonorably discharged. And so like 150 people just fired uh, from the military um, in a, in a summary form of justice that would be very hard to imagine he would have done had it involved white troops. Roosevelt's foreign relations uh, legacy is also mixed. Um, the, on the one hand, in the lower right there, you see he wins the Nobel Prize for negotiating a peace in a regional, big regional war between Russia uh, and Japan. So he he can be a level-headed peace-seeking diplomat. But the cartoon on the on the left uh, shows Roosevelt uh, going after Panama. Now that's a very complicated story. But Roosevelt engages in some, let's just say, he engages in pretty uh, dirty dealing uh, and illegal activity in order to. Uh, create the the country of Panama, and then to strike a really favorable deal with that new country of Panama to run a canal uh, to the Pacific Ocean. So this is a play on the Rough Riders. This is the Roosevelt and his Rough Diggers. You know that he's off to dig the canal um, across across Panama. Roosevelt loved being president, um, and he was a charismatic figure that kind of changed the way the people acted as president. Most presidents didn't campaign, rarely hit the, you know, went on the hustings to uh, promote legislation. Roosevelt loved to meet the public, loved to speak. Um, he always had reporters, you know, hovering around him. So he cultivated them in a way that no other presidents had done before. Um, he was a great, you know, energetic speaker. People would come from all around to, to see him speak because he was so 
passionate about whatever it was, whether it was the tariff or um, uh, or, or Panama. Um, here's a more reserved image of Roosevelt and one is paint, famous painting by John Singer Sargent. And uh, Roosevelt, for all of his manic and exuberant behavior, probably, almost certainly suffered from depression. And many people would, would argue he might have been bipolar in the sense that he had moments of mania and exuberance and kind of unstoppable, feeling unstoppable and other times great heavy darkness, which he only wrote about in his diary um, that, you know, hinted, basically explaining that this is, he had to daily or often fight back the darkness that was creeping up in his soul. And uh, more than one biographer has sort of looked at this image of Roosevelt and, you know, the closer you look at his face, you get a little bit of that mix. He's towering, he's powerful, self-assured, but he's got that little furrowed brow, you know, that makes him look a little bit uncertain. Um, it's a very, it's a beautiful painting. I've, I've had the fortunate to see it uh, in person and it's just as striking as, as, as it is just here on the screen. Roosevelt um, is, makes an unfortunate pledge in um, towards the end of his presidency saying, oh no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna run for another term because he, he, he served McKinley's term and then in 04, he won his own term. So he can still uh, abide by the unofficial rule at that point to run, for, to run, you know, win office twice. He could have served another four years and certainly would have won because he was so popular. Uh, but he said, nope, not going to do it. And here he is, you know, with the enjoying, as he said, uh, the the four years that he's had, he had a perfect, a perfectly corking time, which is an old timey way of saying a bully time, a great time. Um, I love this cartoon, the Roosevelt's finally leaving the house, uh, the White House with, you know, their all of their treasures and accomplishments and so forth. And uh, William Henry Taft, um, William Howard Taft in the back, uh, waving, waving goodbye. Roosevelt doesn't know what to do with himself. So he goes on his famous safari uh, in, in Africa, does several more safaris, one of which nearly costs him um, his life in the River of Doubt, a book that uh, I highly recommend. And then he comes back and he comes up to great adulation in 1910 and pronounces himself thoroughly disgusted with his successor, William Howard Taft. He says, Taft has, I built up this great record of success, this momentum for the progressive era, for, the, for progressive reform, and Taft has frittered it away. It's not entirely true. Taft actually did, kept a lot of progressive policies going like antitrust, but here the image is very clear that Taft is just this slumbering uh, fool and that he's let all the accomplishments of Roosevelt uh, get undone uh, by the powers of, you know, corruption and so forth. So Roosevelt uh, decides in 1912 that he's going to run for re-election. Um, he's going to oust Taft, who wants a second term. And you can see that there in the in the image. Um, he wants the Republican nomination. Uh, the Republican Party shuts him out. Um, it's an ugly political brawl. And Roosevelt's supporters then say, well, OK, we're going to go form our own party, the Progressive Party, or the Bull Moose Party, which is which was its nickname. And here you can see President Roosevelt uh, speaking. And he's not only speaking to crowds, trying to win favor in this very famous four-way election, because it involved not only uh, Taft and Woodrow Wilson, the Democrat, but also Eugene Debs, the socialist candidate, and Theodore Roosevelt, the Progressive Party candidate. So there was a four-way race, and here's Roosevelt at no, no other, uh, he's there on the county courthouse steps in Somerville, uh, New Jersey, which uh, some of you may know know that very location. So yeah, he was out and about drumming up and becoming, he is at his most progressive, in some ways, his most radical uh, at this point. He's really grown into seeing deeper into the ideas of fairness of corporate regulation and so forth. He comes out very vociferously in favor of women's suffrage, for example. He was a little iffy on it back in the early 20th century. Now he's full on saying women deserve uh, the right to vote. So he's more progressive than he's ever been. The race um, doesn't go his way because the Republican party, the Republican vote is split. You can see that if you add up Roosevelt and Taft, uh, that's you know 7.5 million votes, but Wilson wins with 6.9 million votes because those two cannibalized the the Republican uh, vote, and so Wilson uh, wins election, and then he wins he wins re-election. Roosevelt uh, can't can't stand being a, pri a private citizen, so he's as soon as World War One breaks out, he becomes a great champion of U.S. preparedness and demanding that the United States get involved. Um, again, he's a war hawk. He he thinks that war is very important for a national identity and and uh, masculinity. Uh, and he really is pretty savage against his uh, Woodrow Wilson and, and claiming that Wilson is a wimp and so forth. Um, ultimately, events uh, transpire that by 1917, Wilson is committed to uh, entering the war. And uh, 
the, the Great War mobilization effort begins. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt, he's in his 50s, not in very good physical health. Um, a lot of it coming from his adventures in uh, South America and in Africa. Uh, but he demands or he requests that Wilson give him a regiment to lead in uh, in Europe in World War I. Um, Wilson wisely declines. It's probably Wilson doesn't want Roosevelt getting all a lot of that attention. And he also just doesn't think Will, Roosevelt is up to it uh, physically because he's probably not. And so Wilson, uh, uh, Roosevelt is bitterly bitter, embittered by this, but his four sons go off to war and they they are his uh, you know, he, they are his, their father's son. They are, they believe in his ideals. They believe in his martial ideas, the necessity of, to step up and fight. All four of them sign up, go over there. All four of them um, uh, see action. And unfortunately, the youngest, Quentin, um, gets over there as a, as a pilot and he's killed in the, the last year of the war, in the summer of 1918. Um, he's shot down by German, uh, another a German fighter pilot. His remains are eventually discovered. And, you know, a very sick and tired uh, Theodore Roosevelt gets that news by telegram. And he says, you know, it is a pretty heavy burden to bear to know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing, it is a pretty heavy burden to bear to know that you sent a young man off to his death, you know, by, by inspiring, you inspired him and filled him with ideals. So he went and did it and he died. He's, he and his wife are absolutely heartbroken. He's in terrible physical health anyway. Um, and... But he's already, by this point, despite this tragedy, um, planning to run for election in 1920. Uh, he really thinks this is his hour. Wilson's going to be out of office, et cetera. And he's planning for it, but he's in terrible shape. And he he dies um, in January uh, of 1918. Uh, the nation is shocked, goes into, goes into mourning. Um, whether you liked Roosevelt or not, he was a powerful, kind of larger-than-life figure. Um, and he was, you know, barely 60 years old. So he, he, um, he, he dies relatively young uh, for a person associated with so much health and vitality and energy. It kind of really surprises uh, folks. And it's always interesting to think if he had been healthy enough and lived, you know, would he, would he have had that second presidency uh, more than a decade later? We'll, we'll never know. One of the legacies that, you know, of Roosevelt, that we could talk about it now, and but also in the Q&A, is that his, his cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, after Roosevelt and in the 1920s, it's a very conservative time period, a period of uh, rolling back labor rights and so forth. And then the Great Depression sets in and Rose, Theodore Roosevelt, um, excuse me, Franklin Roosevelt, Rose, Teddy Roosevelt's cousin, uh, becomes president and inaugurates another great era of progressive change and reshaping the government, changing people's relationship to the government. Uh, so in many ways, he's Franklin Roosevelt's achievements are on the shoulders of his cousin Theodore Roosevelt uh, 30 years earlier. Uh, they're very much tied together in that in that regard. And, and Franklin Roosevelt was very much inspired by his, his cousin uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah, true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence, which is another kind of hallmark of progressivism, which says, if you have the right to vote and you're starving, uh, if you have the right to vote and your children can't go to school and have to work in coal mines, you're not free. You're not a true a free citizen of a republic. Something has to change. There's an economic dimension to freedom, um, a kind of a floor below which nobody should go. And that's where Roosevelt establishes those ideas. And then Franklin Roosevelt makes them more concrete with things like the eight hour day, the minimum wage, uh, and so forth. Anyway, we could go on, but I think that's a good place to end it. And I will say thank you all very much for uh, tuning in. And uh, we have time now for um, some questions.